Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the Couch Surfer. It's so fun to be on this side of the couch, like not on the couch. Um, and I'm so excited to have these amazing artists here. I've gotten to meet them and talk with them a little bit before this. Um, so I know that they're both amazing and you're in for a big treat. So I'll just introduce them to you and we'll get started. So on the couch today, we have Anna Letta, who's based out of Boise, Idaho. Um, she is a band to watch out for, according to the review, lead vocalist, guitarist, and songwriter. She creates music that is authentic, emotive, and surreal. She isn't afraid to sing her truths and push the musical envelope. Her full-length record, Eternal Hibernation, which is something I'm trying to do right now, um, <laughs> is coming out into the world in the end of March around Tree Fort time. So look out for that. We'll talk more about that, too. Um, yeah, and uh, Mary Pauline Lowry has a novel called The Roxy Letters, and it's forthcoming so soon, April 2020, from Simon & Schuster. Just very exciting. Um, she has an MFA from Boise State University and is a regular contributor to O Magazine. Um, her work has appeared in the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, The Millions, and other publications. All very impressive things to be true. So welcome to them. Um, so I don't how many of you have been a couch surfer before? So lots of new people. This is so cool. Um, so we just kind of have a nice fluid back and forth of music and talking and reading. And so I hope you enjoy it. And we're going to start with Anna. Just a little. All right. Thank little. you. OK, so this song is called Footsteps. And I just recently released it on Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music. So it's out on the internet. Um, but it'll be on the upcoming album. <laughs> Everyone. 
we're gonna have Mary read here really quickly, but I could that song kind of makes me want to ask a question. Yeah. Um, you're, we're all here in human person right now, which is so lovely on a snowy day. And I, we, we've been talking a lot about the internet today and sort of um, how, I don't know, there's this sort of presence pressure and making pressure about the internet. And then this weird feeling of loneliness that comes about. Um, and I, your song made me think of that a little bit. And I, I guess I have a lot of questions for you, but I wonder how you interact with that. Like, how does the internet affect your work? Just to get right into it. Why don't you start? Uh, so, I don't know. I feel like I try to be active on social media and the internet. I mean, as an artist today, you kind of have to be. Um, if you want people to come to your shows and be involved. And part of me likes it. Um, I think as humans, we all like attention at some level. Um, but there's also a part of me that wishes it didn't exist. And I like those times where I can just put my phone away and <coughs> connect with people in front of me and not feel like I always have to be plugged in. Um, like if you look at people and if you're in a group of friends and one person pulls out their phone, then all of a sudden everybody starts pulling mm -hmm. out their phone. And it's like we don't know how to, it's a, almost like we've forgotten how to be present. Mm -hmm. um, so that song definitely is about loneliness and like trying to connect um, despite, I guess, our, the internet world we live in and feeling a little bit anxious about how to kind of stave off loneliness despite technology. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk more about sort of the different uh, impulses that have to that you have to have as an artist. One being the sort of creation mm -hmm. impulse, and one being the promotional impulse. So we can get into that a little bit more later. But do you have any internet thoughts you feel the need to share right uh, now before you read? <laughs> so I I will say that until recently I had an iPhone five, which didn't work very well, and I would leave it in my bag like all day and not know where it was. And then I thought I was doing something nice for myself and I got an iPhone 10 and I'm insanely addicted to it. I look at it like a thousand times an hour. And so a few days ago, I figured out how to turn it to grayscale. So it's black and white oh, yeah. because apparently, well, it's like a kid in a candy store. The candy store was so brightly colored and exciting and the, the iPhone 10 is like that. And so I'm hoping that in gray, I won't be as attracted to it. But um, for me, the internet is a huge distraction. So I have this freedom app on my computer that'll block all internet. And then I need to go like hide my phone in the bottom of the basement or something. But uh, so it's distracting from work. But it is also really helpful for work. So um, I write a lot of nonfiction freelance stuff. So if I'm gonna write for, try to write for a publication, you know, I can access all the back issues of many publications online and read and get a sense of length and tone and voice and so it's a hugely helpful tool and it's also a really helpful tool for connecting with other writers um, so I have a lot of fun with it but um, but yes for me I battle with the distraction element totally I just had to get that out of the way so we don't have to talk about the internet yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much I hate it is all I think about right now all right, let's hear a little bit from you. Okay, so um, I do, as um, Katie said, I have a book that's coming out. This is an advanced reading copy. It's called The Roxy Letters, and it comes out in April. And um, I wrote it, I started it, wrote it, completed it, and sold it when I was in the MFA program here at Boise State University. Um, and I'm not allowed to read out of it until the book comes out. Oh. Um, but it comes out in April, and I'm just like, oh, I'll be doing it um, So I was like lamenting, you know, what am I going to read? And my husband said, well, like, try out some new material. Um, so I, I want to be like Mrs. Maisel. Does anyone watch The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? She like tries out her material to see, like, oh, is it funny? Is it not funny? So, um, I'm going to read three little pieces from this book that I'm working on now that's called, it's currently called What's Up Buttercup, and I wanted to call it Things I Levitate With My Vagina, <laughs> or <laughs> Solid Gold Panty Hamster, <laughs> <laughs> but my agent and my editor were both like, no, <laughs> like, 
like, we went to fucking Costco. You could not call it solid gold panty hamster. Uh, so these three little pieces I'm going to read, if they have a theme, it's vaginas. Um, so be prepared for that. So this little segment is about um, the protagonist, Buttercup, is thinking back to how she met her two best friends, and their names are Paz and Anaita. And a lot of my work has to do with female friendship. So um, this is just sort of the backstory on their friendship. Okay. Um, as I hurried toward the front doors of the Cry for Help building, carrying the edible arrangement, I couldn't wait to ask Anaita and Paz if they'd gotten a load of the hot new janitor. The three of us had been eagerly discussing our various crushes and flirtations ever since we'd met six years before at the University of Texas in a one-credit stretch lab where we'd spent an hour twice a week chatting effortlessly as we worked on mastering the splits. We were good friends, on the cusp of becoming great friends, when I turned 21 and received a surprise inheritance of $21,000 from my dad's wacky Aunt Tanya, who I'd met exactly twice. Apparently, she'd been saving a thousand bucks every year of my life. <laughs> she had not consulted my parents about the no-strings-attached gift, and they were less than thrilled about my windfall. They wanted me to pay back some of my student loans, but instead I gave half of the money away, more on that later, and then proceeded to invest the rest on my future career. Back then, I'd longed to be a performance art event planner. Though I had no <laughs> practical grasp of the profession, I liked the idea of playing the role of a double X chromosome Gatsby, a near invisible behind the scenes mover and shaker who would create magical or impactful experiences for others through my hard work and sleight of hand. I decided I wasn't ready to spend the money actually establishing a business per se. That was way too practical for my taste. So instead, I just practice my future profession by putting on events that I pay for myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that I had been warned each shindig would turn out more disastrous than the one before. For the first event, a treat for my friends and a way to spoil them with my new riches, I organized a tubing trip on the Guadalupe River for Paz Anaita and 17 more of my closest 20 gal pals. And we chartered a bus to drive us to New Braunfels drop us off at the put-in spot, and then pick us up five miles down river. Tubing the Guadalupe in springtime is a rite of passage for undergrads, but because my pretension knew no bounds, I thought our trip could also be a performance art piece. <laughs> so I bought everyone matching gold swimsuits <laughs> and white pool rings sprouting unicorn heads with rainbow manes and tails. Yeah. So that while our booties were submerged in the river, our legs dangled on either side of the unicorn's white necks. <laughs> it looked like we're an army of Athenian warrior goddesses riding mythical beasts down the river. <laughs> I even paid a videographer to capture our five mile journey from the riverbank. <laughs> At first our float was idyllic. The sun was bright but not too hot as we floated below the intermittent shade of majestic bald cypress trees, some of which were over a millennia old. We drank Shiner Bach from coolers we tied to our unicorn shaped inner tubes with ropes and we blasted Lady Gaga's po poker face and other booty shaking chart toppers we pretended to like ironically, but actually really just liked. <laughs> <laughs> but none of us could have known that a pipe had burst <laughs> upstream, <laughs> leaking raw sewage into the river <laughs> at a low enough percentage that we didn't smell a thing, but at a high enough percentage to wreak havoc on our delicate vaginal pH. <laughs> so that two miles into our float, all of our nether regions had started to mysteriously itch. <laughs> and by the time we stepped out of the river at our landing spot, the videographer would capture us all scratching <laughs> at the fiery bacterial vaginosis, <laughs> AKA BV already beginning to grip our loins. Infections it would take months and multiple trips to the student health center each oh, to shake. Yeah. <laughs> Even the videography was a complete failure. Our anxious vagina scratching turned out to be the most exciting footage of the trip. <laughs> As I hadn't accounted for the fact that there is nothing more boring on this earth than watching a group of people tube a lazy river. <laughs> Though my gal pals had been all too eager to take the trip on my dime, they needed someone to blame for the fact that, 
During a time that should have been the most lusty of their lives, their collective downtowns were burning rings of fire. <laughs> Is it any surprise they chose the organizer and funder of the event as a scapegoat on which to pin their ire? <laughs> Only Paz and Anaita decided not to hold me liable, choosing instead to find humor and solace in our joint suffering. If I was walking on campus and a couple of my 17 angry former friends from the tubing tri trip, who Anaita had dubbed the BB bitches, <laughs> spotted me, they'd glare at me and stalk off. But if Paz was with me, she'd shout after their retreating figures, don't act like Buttercup don't itch just like you. <laughs> Which always made Anita giggle and made me feel slightly less alone and ashamed. And because our vaginas were closed for business until we could reestablish our healthy flora, and thus many normal activities like biking to shows or sex were off limits, Paz, Anita, and I spent the ensuing months hanging out together. Because they were both social work majors intent on saving the world, and needing an occasional break from the human suffering described in their coursework, they were happy to stay, take study breaks to watch lighthearted 80s movies with me. We found consolation regarding our fiery nether regions in each other's company. And by the time our sweet flesh had rebounded from that tainted river water, our bond had grown unshakable. <laughs> Anit and Paz had stood by me through sewage-induced bacterial vaginosis, and so I knew they would stand by me through anything. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm tempted to just talk about vaginas for the rest of the night because I think that we do not talk about vaginas enough. And their flora, their very sensitive flora. Um, I can see uh, some of you in the room feeling very uncomfortable right now. And uh, it's important for you to feel more uncomfortable all the time. Um, anyway, but that was lovely. Thank, oh, thank you. you. I, I'm delighted. I've been thinking lately uh, about how you can write about funny things or like joy or make things funny. And that's something I've been trying to integrate into my life more um, instead of just being in a hole of darkness. Um, but I guess, so one thing Christian mentioned, SEMA, which is a reading and workshop series that I run, and one thing that's kind of alongside that in real life experience is um, we do micro interviews as writers, and a question that I like to ask people um, a lot is sort of a hard question, and I'd like to ask both of you. Um, so why do you write? Mm -hmm. Who do you write to, and what do you want your work to do? Oh, wow. Do you want to go first? Or do you <laughs> want to go first? <laughs> I mean, I guess I write um, for kind of... Why do you make... Therapeutic purposes. Yes. Um, a lot of my songs are very sad and a way for me to deal with hard things going on in my life. Um, but I also write just to kind of encapsulate moments of my life. Um, each song is kind of, it comes from a different place, and so um, it's nice to have a collection of songs where you can just be like, oh, this song, uh, this is what I was doing then. Um, so that's part of it. It's mainly self-therapy. Um, I guess, who do I write to? Um, kind or of, for. Kind or, of myself, yeah. sometimes other people. Like some, I have some songs um, that I have written um, that have been about friends or my friends have kind of entered into the song somehow. Um, it's not really about me, but I, I'll sing it in first person anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and then, what was the last question? What do you want it to do? Oh. Like, what do you want to do um, with your work? I think make people be more in touch with their emotions mm -hmm. and like let them know that they're not alone in the hard things like the depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and um, just the hard things in life, like you're not alone in them. Um, yeah, I guess that's the end. Yeah. Your turn. Uh, so why I write, so the reason why I write I think has changed. Um, so I've been writing very in a very focused manner since June of 2000 and um, I'm not quite sure why I wrote before except that I couldn't, nothing else interests me. Um, but um, after the election of 2016, I, 
think I started writing to try to make myself laugh and make myself feel better. And um, and then now I think that's broadening to um, who I write for, to people that want to laugh and have a moment where that's like escapist on one hand, but also um, in a way that addresses some issues that they're interested in. Um, and okay, right? Why I write who I write for, and what do you want it to do? Okay, yeah, right now I want my writing to like make people laugh, and I also I think I fought like I I was always trying to write um, about things that mattered to me in ways that were really serious. But then one time a few years ago, I was with my husband who's in the back row. We we're at the Springs, and um, he's English, and I was reading Bridget Jones' diary about her, you know, <laughs> crushing on like some cute English guy. And I was drinking a beer, and I was like the happiest I'd ever been in my whole life. And, um, <laughs> and I was like, I, I the thought that I could help someone else have a moment like that, where they were just like having a great time, really appealed to me. And there's so much going on in the world right now that so uh, makes it hard to even, you know, think about why are we even getting through a day or whatever. And so I wanted like an antidote to that that just helps people, um, yeah, have a good time, and also stay thoughtful about certain things. Yeah. Right. Cool. Like vaginas. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I, both of you have like pretty significant projects coming to fruition really soon, like actually round about the same two weeks, which is kind of cool. Yes. High five. Um, so I guess I wanted to just hear you talk about what that feels like and maybe talk about each of those projects because a, a record and a novel are both like children like that's like taking a that's like child to college to me like those things have been in like a sort of whatever metaphor you want to use that may or may not involve a vagina um, or a, a female reproductive system or any kind of reproductive system anyway we could go on but tell me about your projects and what they are and what it feels like to have them yeah. come into something into the world how so, are you feeling um my album eternal hibernation i recorded it last um i think we finished it last year around this time and before that the two years before that i had already had the songs written and i was touring and like singing them anyway mm -hmm. and so it was just like Getting it recorded was kind of a struggle. It was something where I felt like, oh, okay, I need to, I need to do this. This needs to happen, but it kept getting delayed. And um, so finally, uh, we finally went into the studio and um, I recorded it with Josh Lewis um, in Built to Spill's um, rehearsal space mm -hmm. in Garden City. And um, finally, like getting it done when it was finished, I was like, wow, I can't believe that I did that. And it's still kind of like that. I kind of made it, and then for most of this year, um, haven't really done a whole lot with it. Um, I released a single in August and have been working with that, but I kind of forget sometimes that it's done and <laughs> until I start promoting it again. So it'll be really cool um, to actually have the CD in my hands and like actually be able to have something to give to other people and have it be out in the world. So exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, will you, before I let yeah. you off the total hook, will uh -huh. you talk a little bit, it's called Eternal Hibernation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Will you talk a little bit about sort of the nature of the project and if there are yeah. like particular themes or s um, like... A lot of it deals with, um, I guess, loneliness and, um, oh, I guess, oh, some of the songs were written after a breakup, so there's kind of that theme in there. And just, oh, I'm trying to think. Um, I guess self awareness and um, just like myself in social situations, also. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of deals with all of that. And it's called Eternal Hibernation um, because a lot of these topics, sometimes you're in those negative situations and you just feel like they're never going to end. <laughs> Or you're in that depression and it's never going to end. And so, um, and it was also Snowmageddon. Mm. Oh. And so I just wanted to, I was like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if I could just hibernate for eternity? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one person that I was working with at the coffee shop just said, 
you mean like eternal hibernation? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay, I'm going to use that <laughs> for an album title. Awesome. It's a great title. It is a great title. Um, okay, tell it. Tell me. Oh, okay. So feels. I talked a little bit about. Oh, so okay. Tell me the question again, though. How, well, like, how I it mean, feels to have a project come out, or I guess more like what's the project? Okay. And, like how I guess how does it feel to have this particular project like coming into the world? It feels like it's so happening. great. So um, I'll hold my book up again because I'm so excited about it, <laughs> and I like have such a crush on the cover that I like flirt with it. Like, uh, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think she likes me too. Um, so it feels really good. Like, as I said, I've been writing um, very seriously for 20 years. Uh, I wrote a book that I self-published. I wrote a book that I worked on for 14 years, and a small press published it, and it sold, like, I don't know, seven copies that my dad bought. Um, and then I wrote another book that I worked on for eight years, and I got this really fancy agent, and she sent it out, and it didn't sell at all. And, um, and then I wrote this book, in like eight months and it sold um, to Simon & Schuster. So it was really long past the point where I thought that I would ever have any sort of like, commercial success. And um, okay, there's this really great, uh, this is a little diversion, oh, I'm just going for it. Okay, there's this great Fresh Air interview um, uh, by Terry Gross, obviously, with this Texas, uh, <laughs> Texas musician whose name I'm forgetting because I'm nervous, but it'll come back to me. And um, she said to him, like, he had just gotten a record deal, and she's like, what was it like not to have a real music career for 35 years? And he'd been playing, like, in Texas Honky Donks to thrilled crowds for 35 years. Um, and, you know, he said, and I love Terry Gross, and I know she probably asked that question maybe for this reason, but he was like, well, ma'am, when I was a kid on my ranch, I'd stick my head in a cistern and holler just to hear the sound. And that uh, was just so awesome. Um, so I feel like I've had my head in the cistern for a really long time. Um, James Hand is that guy's name. And it's the best Terry Gross interview I've ever heard because at one point um, she was asking about something. And again, he was like, ma'am. Sometimes when I look at myself in the mirror, I see a werewolf. And when I, was, <laughs> when I pray real hard, I turn back to myself. And she's like, moving on to the next one. <laughs> anyway, he's great. But, um, but I do think there's just so much pressure to have this like commercial success as an artist that we all put on ourselves and that, um, and that the world puts on us. And, and that it is good to remember that sometimes just making the art is, can be a thing in itself. Oops. So, but, and I'm so excited that it's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I actually, there's another, just a side note, there's, if you like this format, not to like plug somebody else's thing, but why not? Oh, yeah, it's Boise, it. we love yeah. each other. Um, there's mm -hmm. often a series that happens at the James Castle House called Creators, Makers, Doers Live, and anyway, I'm just, Grant Olson was on it a while ago, he's an artist and a DJ at Radio Boise, um, but he said something like, when I was a little kid or when I was younger, I would make art, kind of any kind of art, beca because there was nothing and then there was something. Like, I, there was nothing there and then I made it, made something, and there was something where nothing was. And I think it's the same idea as hollering into the cistern. Like, that's got to be the reason you do it at the end of the day. Like, it can't be to get retweeted. 2,000 times, it has to be because you like making the thing. So I guess that's kind of my next question, and then we'll have you play and read a little bit more, I think, but the process of creating something is so different. <laughs> like, that's why being an artist is so hard, or being a writer is so hard, successfully, commercially, whatever, because you have to have this thing inside you that wants to just make the thing, like privately, it's a very private process so for some people, and then you have to have this part of your personality that can like tell the world <laughs> about the thing and like get the thing into the right hands and kind of convince other people that it's worthwhile and do the like, do to do elevator pitch or like talk to you all like uh, we have to be able to like go be in a hole and then like do this and it's really hard and those are two different impulses and so I guess I'm wondering for both of you how that works for you like how it works in your process or how it works 
for your like the way you value your work too like where do you find the value whether that's in the moment of making or if it's in the moment of playing the song for somebody or if it's the moment that I finally read this or whatever it is but sort of like how you balance those energies I guess between creation and promotion or creation and elevator pitch yeah um so for me I find a lot of joy in the moment of creation um a lot of times I start with lyrics first um and it's just I mean I started songwriting um after my guitar instructor passed away in college and so it was a way for me to like deal with grief and all these like heavy emotions um and there's something really cathartic about taking lyrics that you've written that are like really personal and then singing um and just like creating the song um it and i just it feels really good to do that um and i feel like the first time i ever sing a song it's really powerful in that moment and then when i perform it on stage it it kind of changes um a little bit how so because you're away from the event that inspired it mm -hmm. maybe and maybe you've already healed from whatever the song is about so it feels like you're just almost um you're still sharing the same sentiment but it's not the same emotionally i guess mm -hmm. as when you first wrote it for yourself um I think there's also that element of, okay, now I'm sharing this with people. Yeah. And so that's a little bit different than like writing it when you're alone for yourself. So, um, but I also really enjoy performing um, and sharing songs that I've written just because it's not necessarily for the feedback, it's just singing in front of people and the energy of the audience and having people listen to you feels really good in the act of singing and playing. Um, it's just, it's fun. So, um, yeah, I guess I enjoy both equally. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I also, I guess, I have another question follow up, but you go, uh, go ahead. Okay, so how, how do I kind of split those two sort of duties or jobs? And, yeah. Um, so, you know, fiction writing, it's such a long way to go. I feel like I have coffee on my nose because I'm drinking coffee. <laughs> I probably do. But um, it's a long way to go at home, like in your pajamas for me. Or uh, sometimes I meet some friends that are here at the coffee shop to write, but it's a, primarily a pretty solitary task. Um, and I like that. Um, I think in the way that the literary world at least is set up, you do kind of have to have this other element where you're able to go out and try to share your work with people. Um, and I call that lit scheming. It's my hobby, it's my passion, I love it. And part of the reason I like it so much is that I don't just do it for myself. Like I had mentors helping me from a young age and then so I like to lit scheme for myself I like to lit scheme for others and it's just more entertaining if you got like five things in play we're like oh well, I sent my friend's thing to this editor but my thing's over here and maybe I can help this person that way and it just makes it like this really fun uh, sort of game that but you end up with this beautiful web of friendship and um, and you get to see how many like for a book to come out there's this whole village of mostly women and some cool, awesome men that help to get the book out, whether it's like a copy editor, an editor, an agent, a marketing person, a PR person. It's really like uh, the person who connects with Barnes & Noble, the person who connects with the Indies. It's like a huge ton of people that do work. And so to just get to meet some of those people and say thank you, like it's, it's super fun. And it's also fun, and I'll stop talking, but I spend a lot of time in my pajamas and my track pants. And then... Um, <laughs> I feel like fashion is sort of a puzzle that I don't really understand. And so when I do leave the house, it's like, like, can I figure out how to like have a handbag that matches, looks right with my shoes? Like right now I was like, I don't, this, these shoes with this sweater aren't that great, but they're pretty good with the shirt I have on under the sweater. So like this whole thing, um, that is sort of fun for me because I'm bad at it. <laughs> it's like thin my beginner's I love mind getting an sweater. outfit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I do too. Um, okay, cool. I, I would like to hear some more from both of you. Um, do you feel like reading again? Sure. Yeah, why yeah. don't you read okay. again and then 
Yeah. Okay, so we're going back to um, buttercup and vaginas. I There's like a part in here that involves vaginal weightlifting, and I don't know if I need to explain what vaginal weightlifting <laughs> is or if I even have it in me to explain, so I don't know. <laughs> like, raise your hand if you know what vaginal weightlifting is. Okay. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you feel like you can roll with it without knowing. Okay, raise your hand if you need an explanation for vaginal weightlifting. Okay, nobody needs one. <laughs> okay, my husband wants an explanation for vaginal Okay, so vaginal weightlifting. Raise your hand if you've heard of a yoni egg. If you have, it's because of Gwyneth Paltrow. Okay, a yoni egg is like, it's an egg made out of jade or rose quartz usually. And um, they've been around for thousands of years, and women put them in their vaginas to increase sex drive or lubrication. Or there's all these, some people say, well, cure your life, whatever. Um, <laughs> but there are people that do vaginal weightlifting where they tie a string to this yoni egg, and so the yoni's in their yoni, and the string's coming out, and they tie the string to something that weighs something. And then, um, and like the world record holder, I think, has lifted something that's like nine pounds. And there are people on the internet that say they move furniture. With <laughs> I've never seen it. I've never seen anyone. So anyway, I just wanted to prep you so that you know what's what's happening. Here. Um, okay, so this is a scene. We're back with our friend Buttercup. She's in financial straits, and um, this is a scene where she first hears about a job um, working for like an online sex guru, who is also a vaginal weightlifter. Uh, okay, oh, in Buttercup, she works on, oh, well, you'll find out, actually. Okay, here we go. 90 seconds later, the hotline phone rang. National Hoarders Hotline, you, could t you too can have a clear heart, a clear head, and a clear house. Buttercup speaking, I said. Sometimes I even accidentally answered my own cell phone that way. Buttercup Ray Price said an oily voice I immediately recognized as belonging to a debt collector. No one else on earth would call the anonymous National Hoarders Hotline and ask for me by my full name. I'm so sorry, but she doesn't work here anymore, I said, and gently hung up the phone with a shaking hand as I silently mouthed, you asshole. In order to distract myself from my financial straits, I decided to illicitly check my personal email during my 90 seconds of wrap time when I should have been completing my intake form about my caller. But what was I going to fill in for caller type anyway? There was no box to check for debt collector. That's when I saw an email blast from the sex guru, Linda Tsunami, with the subject line, join the seismic orgasm squad. It was in my Pandora's inbox. The last thing I needed was to be canned by HR, so I grabbed my phone to allow for private viewing. The email said, Tuesday, February 25th, 2014, 11.30 a.m., from Linda at comelikeatsunami.com. <laughs> Two. What's up, Buttercup, at Hotmail.com. Wanted, social media ninja. Dear High Priestess of Vaginal Power, would you like to have the words Seismic Orgasm Squad member on your business card? <laughs> Duh, I thought, who wouldn't? <laughs> Are you social media savvy? Great with a turn of phrase, witty and funny. A skilled occasional photographer. Want to teach the world to sing? about cervical orgasms. <laughs> a cervical orgasm? What the fuck was that, I wondered. When hooking up with Waylon, a clitoral orgasm alone was a lofty and often unattainable goal. <laughs> Interested in alternative female sexuality practices, nutrition, health, and adventure? Bonus points for having taken one of my cunt creativity courses. <laughs> As a premier sexologist and cunt creativity specialist, I bounce between the jungles and beaches of Borneo and the shores of Lady Bird Lake in Austin, Texas. Ideally, the social media ninja would live in one of those locations. But most important to me is finding a person who's a perfect fit for the job. The position starts at 10 hours a week, but will likely grow organically. I'd like to hire someone ASAP as I will need a flurry of PR activity in preparation for a couple's sex retreat I plan to host in Austin during South by Southwest. Those interested should email me a cover letter in CB. Love and earth-shattering O's, Linda Tsunami. <laughs> Below was a large high-def photo of social media star and self-proclaimed alternative sexologist Linda Tsunami standing in warrior pose on the beach. She wore a mullet dress, short in front, long in back, with a full <laughs> skirt that blazed a bright orange before the backdrop of blue ocean, bluer sky, her strong, lean arms stretched high above her, and she was barefoot, 
but it was no mystery where her shoes had gone. <laughs> they hung from a string that disappeared below her skirt. <laughs> Linda's tsunami's flip-flops dangled on a silk thread attached to a yoni egg that was inside her clearly powerful vagina. I'll be honest, I would have considered the email blast nothing more than a laugh had I not been so fucking broke. And I wondered, could a job as Linda Tsunami's social media ninja help pull me back from the financial brink? I think I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you write a lot. So, the Roxy letters, I don't think we talked about what it's about, but there's a sex cult in it. Um, a, or a big. Will you talk about what the Roxy letters is about a little bit? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, the Roxy letters is set in my hometown of Austin, Texas, and it is about a young woman named Roxy who is kind of underemployed artistically stymied, sort of undersexed, and she works at the deli of the flagship Whole Foods, because Whole Foods started in Austin. And um, she is upset about the ways that her town is growing and changing and becoming more corporatized, so when her beloved video store closes down and the Lululemon moves in, she decides that she needs to like take action and, and make change happen. Awesome. So it's about this, that. Uh, and it's written in letters to her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, who's living with her but isn't paying his rent on time. <laughs> cool. And but there's like an undertone of sex cult. Oh yeah, so there is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if there can be like an undertone. Yeah. Of that. So um, so Roxy does have a run-in with um, with the sex cult. And okay. it, I mean, it's embarrassing for me to talk about the particulars of the cult. Okay. So. That's fine. Um, I guess my qu okay. My question is just that it seems like you write a lot about sexuality and women, especially, and I wonder why that's important to you, or why that comes up a lot in your work. So, uh, okay, so both of these books, um, the Roxy Letters and this book that I'm kind of working on now, they have at their center a or not at their center, but they, they involve a woman who's a kind of a peripheral character who has these two different women that each have created sort of a, a cult, like a sex cult. <laughs> and I'm interested in sex cults in, um, that are led by women that are sort of dynamic and powerful and, and figure out how to make a really good living, getting people to pay them to teach them about stuff that they might be better not knowing about. I don't know. Um, so, I mean, women's sexuality has always interested me for probably obvious reasons. But, uh, but yeah, I like this kind of side niche. Uh, and I am also just interested in the internet as a way, it's a wild west on the internet. Like, um, there's a switch that I pay so I can take her classes on the internet. And, um, you know, she makes $300,000 a year because people like me pay her money to take her classes. And she's like, it's a wild west, y'all. Like, I got a PhD, but no one cares. They take my class because they want this content that I have. Um, and as someone who's always struggled to make a living, it's interesting to me that this, this new frontier is there um, to make money. Like, if you can get 100 people to pay you 100 bucks a month, you're making, in my opinion, really good money. And so that is something that has always fascinated me and to throw, like, weird sex stuff in there is just extra interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a frontier that was not around when I was 20, 25. Like, there, there was no way to, there, there, there was no way, way to make money on the internet. And so I have students at BSU that lament, you know, the fact that it's harder, you know, to make a living. There aren't the kind of jobs where um, people have pensions and retirements as much anymore, but then there are these other new sort of weird avenues where if you can just figure out how to sell something that people want, you can make money. And that's not something I've ever been able to do, and I'm interested by people who totally. can. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I think maybe actually Anna, if you'd be okay with playing another mm -hmm. song for yeah. us. Do you have any? Yeah. What? Nothing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, this next one is also off of the upcoming album Eternal Hibernation and I'll actually be releasing it as a single um, in a few months probably sometime in February um, and it's kind of about um, the transformation of um, I guess I was in a relationship in college that didn't work out and um, it's kind of about that transformation from being really hurt by that to kind of acceptance um, and feeling okay yourself. So it's called Healed Happily Alone with Longing. Mm -hmm. 
so interesting. You're both sort of totally arresting to watch, and your work is so different in tonally. Um, it's so fun to have you both on the couch. Um, Anna, you, so you said you only came to writing songs after your teacher died, which was pretty recently uh, 2015? Like, yeah, like yeah. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, your writing, like, just on a lyrical level mm -hmm. is pretty interesting to me. Like, the, you're, t it's strange and, like, not, it's unexpected, some mm -hmm. of the turns of that song especially. Why, like, what did you do before writing songs like how did you come to music I guess if that mm -hmm. obviously you must have been playing music yeah. if you were playing the guitar but can you talk yeah. a little bit um, about that so I guess um, I started playing um, guitar in eighth grade um, and took lessons all throughout high school um, but really just was focusing on playing guitar and I was in uh, vocal jazz in high school and played jazz a lot um, even throughout college um, and I got to the College of Idaho, and I thought they had a, a guitar performance um, major, and then I found out that they didn't. So um, music theory and composition oh, okay. was uh, the kind of my next best bet if I wanted to be a music major, since I couldn't kind of focus on performance. Um, so, so I guess I kind of got thrown into writing and composing, um, but I've always been... Um, I always loved English and writing, and um, for a while in high school, I would try to write poetry and song lyrics, most of which I never shared with the world. Sure. Um, but I always, so I always enjoyed um, the aspect of lyric writing, um, and I guess once I got to college, it just was kind of the perfect environment to. Um, and this guitar instructor that I had had passed away. She taught me. Uh, her name was Christy Green, and she taught me all of the finger picking. Um, through classical guitar lessons. So I kind of took that and started combining that idea um, with jazz chords just because I love um, chords that kind of um, sound different and unique. So I started combining the finger style and that um, with, I guess, my own sets of lyrics, which are really personal. And um, also, I kind of like having a sense of mystery in the lyrics. I kind of like it when people don't exactly know what it's about or um, they can kind of interpret it in different ways. Um, so yeah, I'm not afraid to like write a line that doesn't really make sense, right. but could make sense in different contexts. Cool, that's wonderful. Um, well, I think it's about time for us to take a break. So on the note of mystery, uh, <laughs> go ahead and Enjoy whatever you enjoy during your break. <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Um, so I, a question that has been coming up for me as you've been talking or we've been talking also, let's just please note that Mary has revealed the shirt that goes up <laughs> And I'm wearing a mullet. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so I... The time that passes, like you were talking about how you recorded this record a year mm -hmm. ago, and the time, I mean, the time that passes between the moment you write something and the moment it becomes a book, like those can be long expanses yes. of time. And so I'm really interested in sort of how we keep life in the thing that's old. Like you've been reading for us something you're working on right now, which is really mm -hmm. exciting and like immediate, and you get to kind of read the room and how it's working and let that affect the work or like um, it's a really active exciting process but you're about to read like on tour and you've been on tour but you're about to read from this book that you finished when or like we're uh, writing when so I started it in October of 2018 and it sold in like September of 2019 which is like an amazingly fast turnaround yeah. in the publishing world. Like you get to read from something you were writing two years ago. Yeah. Which and then, is crazy. And then it's a year and a half until it's published. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is a very fast turnaround. Yes. But still like kind of a long expanse of time from when it was being written. And you are you were writing these songs a few years ago. Yeah. So I guess, and you've been on tour a mm -hmm. fair amount. So how do both of you kind of like square that for yourselves as your performing work or working on new work while also performing old work? Like, how does that work for you? Um, like, Anna, what are you working on now? And how um, does that kind of 
butt up against what I guess, you're releasing. So the past, I guess over the past five months, I've maybe written one or two songs. Um, and so it was, I kind of like took a break from writing, not purposefully, because life happened. And um, I, but so that will be something new, like that's starting to, that'll be like the next thing, which is exciting, and I like that. Um, but as far as the songs on Eternal Hibernation, um, oh, like some of those songs, I wrote them in 2015, mm -hmm. and so that feels like ages ago. And, but the songs themselves, um, you kind of get a different perspective from it after having more life experiences, so the kind of the meaning of the song as you're performing it changes mm -hmm. in a way. So it might not, it's, I think there's still a way to find, like put life back into it, um, no matter whether you wrote it 10 years ago or just wrote it. Sure. Um, so I don't really get tired of performing the same songs. What about you? How's reading Roxy Letters been? Um, or so I haven't read from it much. I was lucky enough uh, where I got sent on a pre-release book tour to go meet booksellers, and there I would give a little speech about the book and hold the book, but I haven't read from okay. it much, so I don't, I don't really know how that'll be, but um, hopefully it'll be like seeing a friend that I haven't seen in a while. Cool. Um, and... I can't, I'm, it's so fresh for me to have any sort of like audience or reader that I can't imagine that I would start feeling like tired of it uh, for a while. Um, but yeah, and I think with books too, you know, you have this phase where you're promoting a book and then you don't ever promote it again. So it's not like a musician. Um, my husband and I were having dinner right before we came here and I was talking about this Texas musician, Ray Wiley Hubbard. I saw him once at Willie Nelson's 4th of July picnic and he, the crowd was like screaming for him to play this song up against the wall, Redneck Mother, that he wrote, I think in the 70s. And he was just like, be careful what songs you write because you never know what song you're gonna have to play every night for the next 30 years of your life. <laughs> and like, I just don't think writers have that issue because even if they have a favorite book, if they go on a book tour, they don't read from the favorite. You know, they don't read from the fan favorite book, they read from the new book. And so sure. I think it's a little bit different than musicians in totally. that way. Yeah. Cool. Well. Speaking of which, would you like to read us, I I think, maybe uh, some work hustle-related gig economy Sure. Stuff? Well, okay, is actually, is it okay if I read one more piece sure. from the Buttercup? Totally. Um, and, you know, maybe I could skip the other one or skip something. Yeah, whatever um, sounds good to you. So I wanted to just read, so we had Buttercup finding out about this... Um, this job opportunity. And so I just wanted to read the cover letter that she submits when she's trying to get that job. <laughs> yes. And it, it is a tune. I have another essay here that's about like, or like a joke, a comedic piece, not an essay about gig economy jobs that maybe I'll get to, but this is sort of in the same vein. So we'll, we'll stick to that. And I think um, an obsession right now in my work is just like, how do people make a living? Because um, for a lot of us, it can be hard. So um, this is Buttercup's cover letter to, or yeah, to Linda Tsunami when she's applying for this job as her social media nin ninja. Um, so, Wednesday, February 26, 2014, 2.14 a.m., from what's up buttercup at hotmail.com to linda at comelikeatsunami.com. Dear Linda, I want to work for you as your social media ninja because, one, I think you're a genius. <laughs> Two, I can bring more fun and flair to your brand as a high priestess of vagina power. More on number one. On my lunch break from my weird, sometimes stultifyingly boring, sometimes insanely rewarding, sometimes just insane job answering calls on a nonprofit hotline, my best friends and I sit on a picnic bench table and pour over your Instagram feed. The images and videos we see make us exclaim. They make us cover our mouths. They make us say, oh no she didn't, and oh yes she did. Humor has power. Attention has power. You make people laugh with delight, and with bright colors, beautiful sunsets, a live body, and an overgrown coconut hanging from your vag, you make them giggle and dig in, riveted, to figure out what you're all about. I wanna be part of that. More on number two. You got a good thing going. But let's ramp it up. Let's camp it up. Let's even make it controversial. 
I see you at Disneyland with fireworks exploding overhead and a stuffed Mickey Mouse dangling between your legs on a string. <laughs> the copy will say, do you want to be a young, oh, sorry, skip that last part. Uh, do you want to be a young, undersexed Hannah Montana or a grown-ass Miley Cyrus riding a wrecking ball? The caption will say, get out from under the mouse that's keeping you small, controlled, and corporate-owned. Harness your sexual power. Learn to come like fireworks and live your best damn life. <laughs> Hashtag things I levitate with my vagina. Hashtag Disneyland. Hashtag Mickey Mouse. Hashtag Miley Cyrus. Hashtag Linda Tsunami. Hashtag sexual fireworks. Hashtag come like a queen. <laughs> Linda Tsunami, you are already a force of nature. But with a fun feisty copy I'm going to write on your side, you'll break a million followers on Insta quicker than you could come using a high powered vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, there's another reason I want to work for you. Let's call it number three. I want what you have. I don't want to be a foremost sexologist and sexpiration to women across the land per se, but I want to feel wild and unbridled, or maybe just true to myself. I want to do work that is fun and freeing. I want not just to help people who are mired in their yuck, as I do in my current job, but to raise them up as they reach for their yum. I want to experience my own yum, which I've let myself lose sight and taste of. And dare say, I also just need the extra cash. I believe in your mission of empowering women to enjoy their vaginas, to use their sexual energy and exuberant orgasms to create the lives they want to lead. And as your social media ninja, I would do my best to supercharge that mission, to help you burn even brighter. Aspirationally and orgasmically yours, Buttercup Ray Price. By the time I finished typing up this missive of desperation, I wasn't sure if I actually believed it or if I'd just written what I thought Linda Tsunami would want to hear. But did it matter? What mattered was that I was taking some realistic action to try to earn more money. Because the only thing that was going to actually bust me out of my problems was some cold hard cash. It was 3 a.m. when I sent my cover letter along with my piddly and unimpressive CV hurtling through cyberspace to the inbox of Linda at comelikeatsunami.com. I suddenly felt wrung out and exhausted, sure my efforts would amount to nothing. I crawled back into bed with Waylon, and despite his snores, fell into a dark and dreamless sleep. So we were talking about um, all the weird jobs that Mary has done, and all the jo different jobs we do or have done, and how the gig economy works and just sort of being a person who wants to make work outside of money like you recently got a book deal but there were many years before that where writing didn't mean money and it doesn't for a lot of people and same with music so I guess how what do you both do for work and how has that affected your creative life so I kind of fell into teaching guitar lessons. Um, I was in college and it was summer and I was looking for a summer job. And then um, one of my music teachers in high school said, hey, my nephew um, lives in Caldwell and he's looking for a guitar instructor. Do you teach lessons? And I said, I do now. <laughs> and so I started um, teaching guitar lessons in the practice rooms and uh, the professors at C of I were very nice. Um, and let me teach lessons while I was going to school. So I started um, just teaching in the afternoons in between classes. Um, and then I got to Boise after graduating and I thought I need a big person job now. So I'm going to write for a newsletter company. Um, so I started full time there and um, got probably six or seven months in and realized I just missed face to face communication and I missed music. Um, so I left that job and found a space above Penn Gillies in mm -hmm. Old Boys and Music Studios and have been there ever since. So um, I teach probably 20 to 25 students um, privately and it's great because um, I love teaching and I love sharing this instrument with others um, who span all ages. Um, and guitar lessons were a super important part of my adolescence and upbringing, and so it's nice to be able to give that back. Um, but it's also really flexible. Um, I have time to um, gig, I have time to like promote my own music and write. 
Um, so it just works out really well um, for, I guess, everything that I do. Okay, cool. What about you? Um, so, you know, I've had to shelter my writing for many years. Um, and so I work construction. I worked at a domestic violence shelter uh, in Southwest Colorado. I worked on the National Domestic Violence Hotline for years. Um, I did public policy work to try to get funding for domestic violence shelters in Texas. And then um, for the past probably seven years, I've had more of like a hodgepodge approach where I um, have part-time jobs and I do freelance work um, and just kind of piece together money to live on without having like a single um, full-time job. Sure. Great. I don't know. Mostly I just want to say it's hard to make it work, everybody. Um, do you want to play something yes. for us? Let's so see. I have, um, so over the past five months, um, I kind of, I guess over the summer, I felt the need to try teaching um, at a traditional school, uh, I guess. And so I took a job um, teaching at an elementary school, um, teaching music for first through sixth grade. And uh, I was also taking night classes for teacher accreditation um, or certification at the same time. And um, was also still teaching private lessons. So I was very busy and uh, kind of ran myself into the ground um, and became very, very depressed. So this next song um, comes out of that. And um, it's called Reverb and it's not recorded. It's not on eternal hibernation and I've never performed it. So Yay. you guys get to hear it first.
said that that came a little bit out of the time that you were working a lot and feeling burnt out. I guess I'd love to hear from both of you about process a little bit. You said that lyrics come first usually, mm -hmm. but how does writing a, like what does writing a song look like for you? Like, do you put on some special socks, or like, what do you do? No, um, I guess some. I guess at first, um, like lyrically, sometimes I'm just like in the weirdest, I guess, situations where I like lyrics will come to me. For example, this song, um, I was at first Thursday, and I was um, playing with a band called Maita from Portland, and. Um, I just, during her set, I just pulled out my phone and I probably looked like I was just being really rude and on my phone the whole time <laughs> during her set, but I was writing um, these lyrics mm -hmm. and I just like had to get it down. So um, I guess that happens. And then for a while, I just, I just kind of like leave it alone for a while. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times there's a big separation from like writing the lyrics to actually finding a part on my guitar that um, fits with it. So I'll just, sometimes I'll try playing something and it doesn't work for a set of lyrics. And so um, sometimes it'll be like two months later, three months later, where um, I'll kind of come up with a guitar part and have the lyrics in front of me. Um, and it just all kind of like fits together. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there's definitely some time involved. Yeah. Is it usually like that? Like it comes in a flash in mm -hmm. a moment you're not yeah, expecting? Yeah, lyrics sort of. are definitely like yeah. that, yeah. What about you, Mary? What's process like for you? Are you a morning person, nighttime? Per like, what does it look like? Uh, so I write usually in the mornings, and um, process, like, I'm really happy when I have a project that I'm working on, and then sometimes I don't have a project, but I can't make one happen, and so um, part of it is just trying to be available to the muse. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert has this book called Big Magic, and she talks about... Um, Greeks, the Greeks and Romans used to think that people had a creative genius that was like uh, a little creature that lived in their home that would sometimes <laughs> come to them and help them and sometimes wouldn't. And um, so I like that concept that helps me, you know, that if I'm not doing well, it's like, well, my genius didn't come today. Uh, but I put out water for my creative genius. Um, and sometimes I get on a roll and I do it every day and usually my writing is better um, then than not. Yeah. Yeah. But even if I don't have a great idea for a long project, I often am writing essays or um, doing other things where I'm kind of keeping those muscles going. Totally. Well, would you read your kombucha essay? Maybe? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, this is a, well, okay, so when I, this is an essay I wrote for O Magazine, and when I started graduate school here, I was very beat down from like years of failure, and I thought, okay, my first year, I'm going to submit a hundred things, or uh, so like submit a short story to a journal or a contest, or pitch an idea to a magazine or a newspaper, and um, I think I got 98 rejections. Um, and but one acceptance that I got was um, I had this essay accepted to O Magazine, which was like a big break for me, and now I write for them very regularly. And um, I think it's important to remember for me to remember for other people to remember like when you see someone that's like having a moment where things are going well it's often because there was like so many times that things didn't work out the way that they wanted or whatever so um i also have an essay coming out in the february of issue of O that i think should hit the newsstands in like a week so uh buy your own mags if you like such thing uh and this is uh this essay is called strange brew and it's a lot about moving to boise so and it has a little bit of singing in it. I'm not a songbird, so just like, plug your ears. <laughs> uh, okay, a few years ago, I fell hard for kombucha, the fermented tea that supposedly can help prevent everything from cancer to gray hair. I don't know if that's true. I just know it's a nice pick-me-up. I bought my kombucha at Whole Foods, but it's easy to make, requiring only water, sugar, tea, a little vinegar, and a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, or SCOBY, a yucky term for a fairly yucky thing. <laughs> you just brew a batch of sweet tea and add the SCOBY, a rubbery raft that sits atop the batch and helps keep out bad bacteria as it ferments the liquid below. Thus, SCOBY is an alchemical feat of nature. It's also whitish with a brown underside, jellyfish meets flan, jello meets the blob. Just as a fan of bratwurst might not wish to see how the sausage is made, I didn't care to create a disc of goo. Then I met Charlotte. My 
husband and I were living in a guest house with a housemate in Orange County when Charlotte moved into the front house. Having just arrived from hippied out Maine, she was deflated to find that she couldn't bum a partial SCOBY off a neighbor. <laughs> Ferraris and facelifts proliferated in our neighborhood. Bacteria lumps, not so much. <laughs> so she explained she'd just have to grow a SCOBY in our shared laundry room. When she mentioned this, like, if you smell something weird, don't freak out, we did some Googling. WebMD warned against DIYing the process. Bad bacteria might sneak in, or the fermentation could go rogue, making the brew alcoholic. But we did what polite people do, said nothing, electing to be <laughs> privately repulsed. <laughs> then, a few weeks later, Charlotte insisted we come try her kombucha. And again, politeness won. We took hesitant sips and couldn't deny the tea's deliciousness. It was a sour elixir, herbal and earthy. This is the best kombucha I've ever tasted, I raved. You should make your own, Charlotte said, it's easy. Even as I hesitated, I realized I just couldn't mooch her booch forever. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I knew, I was walking home with my own hunk of ick. I developed an instant affection for my scoby. I like to peer at it, tend to it, and if you're somewhere out there drunk and passed out on the floor, I sang in the style of Concrete Blonde's Joey. Oh, Scoey, Scoby, I'm not angry anymore. <laughs> Our roommate called my Scoby the old lady. <laughs> Charlotte began coming over to use our juicer. Ginger juice really puts kombucha over the top or test a new flavor on us. Tangerine basil, lavender pear, my jar made stuff was good, but bested by what she brewed in her two gallon beverage dispenser, whose scoby was the size of a dinner plate. Over sips, we dreamed up kombucha cocktails, debating whether the tea was healthy or just a tasty way to feel virtuous. When I was accepted to a graduate program in Boise, I was pained. Our fermentation salon would cease to be. To comfort myself, I bought a beverage dispenser like Charlotte's. She peeled a layer off her mega scoby, and I put it in my jug. Just before we left, Charlotte came by and we took up our favorite subject. It is symbiotic, she said. I feed SCOBY and SCOBY feeds me. I didn't fully understand what she meant. Not yet, anyway. My husband and I drove to Idaho where we knew no one. How would we make friends? And then it occurred to me. What do you have to share? I posted on a local message board asking whether anyone had a SCOBY to spare. I wanted to try Idaho's cultures. A woman named Kelly wrote, sure, just come over. And thanks for her slime, I gave her a piece of citrine, which she turned into a pendant. I gave a bottle of my brew to my neighbor, Christine, who has four grandkids and as many suitors, and pedals around the neighborhood with her dog, Gucci, in her bike basket. She called me the best neighbor ever, then invited me to brunch. I'd never imagined that kombucha could open up a whole new town for me, but that's just another of its powers. I feed it, it feeds me, it grows beneath my sink, and it grows my life <laughs> outward and upward, sip by sip. <laughs> we were talking, so Mary is from Austin, mm -hmm. and both Anna and I are from here, more or less. Um, and we were, I was just thinking a little bit about the premise of the Roxy letters and how Boise's in a moment not unlike the moment Austin was probably in when you were there as a younger person and I'm wondering just kind of how both of you are feeling about our little town here and being uh, here and yeah I absolutely love Boise um, you know I've toured a lot and gone to many different cities and I'm always happy to come home um, and I, I don't know, I just, I think with Tree Fort, Music Fest, and um, Radio Boise, I think we have a lot of, we might not be a big city, but we have a lot of cool things going on um, all the time, which is really cool, and it's been fun to see, um, as I've been in Boise for a while, uh, other bands from Portland and Seattle will be like, oh, you're from Boise? Uh, we want to play there, and so they all, they all want to start coming, and they want to play, um, because they, they hear it's really cool, and so that is cool to see. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes me proud to be from here, and um, yeah, I think I'll stay put for a while. Cool. Are you feeling like a growth situation in a negative like, or positive way, or in any way? I feel like some of it is positive. Um, 
I feel like the more people who move here, um, just you have different personalities and um, people just bring different things to the table, which is cool. Um, and also, if I mean, if you're a musician and you leave, you can't really help your community grow and everybody has people who kind of created <coughs> systems for them. Um, and so, but if you leave, you can't be that for the <coughs> next generation or the up and coming musicians or writers or um, those things. But <coughs> yeah, so I think I see more positive than negative. Um, I mean, maybe negative. I just I hope the housing situation is figured out and affordable mm -hmm. housing. I think there are some things where Boise just hasn't. Um, we haven't thought of early expanded for the growth yet. Mm -hmm. Sure. What about you? How does it feel to be in this place? Like having been in that place, and what similarities or differences? Or um, so Boise here? reminds me a lot of Austin, like in nineteen. Um, or like early 80s maybe yeah. um, and it's kind of at a sweet time uh, when I came here or I was thinking about coming here I was applying to graduate school at the MFA program and I had a mentor and friend Dennis Johnson who was teaching at the program and so I emailed him and said like hey what do you think about Boise and he said you know it's it's in that moment where it's cheap, it's hip, it's easy to get around. If they offer you money, get out of here before they ruin it like every other damn place. <laughs> and um, so to me, it definitely does not feel ruined. So yeah, but definitely growing and changing. Yeah. How has, like, in terms of Austin, what what are your feelings about it now? Or how was that progression? So now when I go home, so I moved away from Austin um about seven years ago, and now when I go home, it's all—it's as if I'm going to a big city I've never been to, except I know how to get around and I have a bunch of friends there. So in that way, it is kind of cool. It feels, it's fun, and I go there a lot, but um, it's been like a local pastime to complain about the growth since before I was born, and so um, I'm just very, I'm just very used to people complaining about it, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's more expensive. There's more traffic. But uh, I have a very good friend who's, oh, maybe 20, 25 years older than I am. And he's like, you know, everywhere that's cool is trafficy and expensive. Like, it's still cool here. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I still like it. And I think that, you know, the true problems, like I have friends that I went to high school with who have had houses in their family for generations that are losing those houses due to property taxes rising. Like, that's, those are the real problems. Mm -hmm. And, um and, and that is a terrible thing that happens when places grow and areas get sure. gentrified, clearly. But, um, but Austin is hip and happening. It doesn't have the problems of like a collapsing steel town or something. So, I, yeah, it seems pretty good. Yeah. It seems okay. Yeah, I find it really funny when people complain about Boise growing because growing up I felt like all we wanted was for people to like us <laughs> <laughs> and like come here and keep liking us and keep coming so y'all got what you wanted um, and I still want it to keep happening I think uh, and to also be able to pay rent um, so I think it'd be great to hear you two together now if you're into it so usually at, for those of you who've been here before you've seen this but usually we try to have some kind of collaboration between the artists and um, I think it's really fun to see how it turns out. So would either of you like to preface anything? Uh, I'd be happy to. Do you want to preface it? anything? Uh, nope. <laughs> okay, so this is an essay I wrote for The Millions, which is an online um, site that does a lot of culture and books. And um, it's about um, a time when I, I hired a witch to help me. I was having a lot of problems with envy and jealousy of other writers that I knew that were like successful and having careers. And um, the witch that I'm talking about here is this woman who's now a close friend. Her name is Amanda Yates Garcia. Her witch name is the Oracle of Los Angeles. And she just published a book um, called Initiated Memoir of a Witch that came out in October. Grand Central published it. Um, she's an intellectual powerhouse. It's a very beautiful memoir. I highly recommend it. If you go, if you type in Initiated um, which or initiated memoir, I think it would pop right up and you could, I'm sure, get it rediscovered or ordered there. So, um, should I just launch into it? Sure. Okay. How a witch cured my writerly envy. I parked my car in front of the house of a modern day witch called the Oracle of Los Angeles. I climbed the stairs of the giant, rambling, craftsman style house to knock on her door. 
Through the glass, I could see a book bookshelf loaded with tomes by Salman Rushdie and Joy Williams. This, I thought to myself, was one very well-read witch. I had arrived at the witch's house because envy, that most unflattering of emotions, had long been gnawing at my innards. Often it made me feel lightheaded, almost dizzy. I wanted what other people had. In particular, I wanted what many of my friends had, friends whose career success came to them with what looked to me like little effort and mountains of luck, while I toiled for years on projects that always seemed to bounce off the rim. The Oracle, whose real name is Amanda Yates Garcia, opened the door, welcoming me by smudging me from head to toe with burning sage and sweet grass, ringing a bell up and down the length of my body. She ushered me into the dining room, an open space with a long, low altar covered in tarot cards, candles, a set of animal horns coated in silver glitter, crystals, feathers, and other objects. I gave her cash. The spell would cost the equivalent of 50 minutes at a therapist's office. And offerings for the goddess, chocolate, and a small bottle of whiskey, as well as items I would need for our spell. The witch gave me a delicious cup of tea made from rose petals, and then she asked me why I had come. For an hour we talked. I told her the long history of pain that had brought me there, about the envy I had tried to assuage through various healing modalities. I cried. The oracle seemed unfazed. She told me that everyone who came to her cried. The oracle told me we would no longer use the words envy or jealousy to describe this emotion that had a hold of me. Envy was a demon that inhabited me, and so we would call it a demon, and in the course of the spell, we would drive the demon out. Before we began, I went to the bathroom. The witch's toilet reading included a tattered paperback of mythology, Lori Moore's self-help, and a booklet entitled Witch Hunting, Past and Present, and the Fear of the Power of Women. I was somehow pleased to see that like my bathroom, the witches could use a scrub. When I returned, it was time for the spell to begin. The witch stood up and let out a piercing whistle while fervently shaking a gourd rattle, which I first mistook for maraca. As she spoke, her voice changed, became low and growling, and beautifully theatrical. Hail guardians, spirits of the east, watchtowers of the mind, guardians of intelligence, mighty guardians of the air, we call you now. Witness our rights, charge our spell, be here with us. While I felt I should probably close my eyes, I kept them open as she called spirits from all four directions. This performance, done so earnestly, was fun, dramatic, almost campy in its showy playfulness. But it was also poignant and powerful. It alone, I thought, was well worth the price of admission. These spirits of water, wind, air, and fire, called from the north, south, east, and west, would join us and help create a sacred, protected space where our spell work could occur. Did I believe this? I felt it didn't entirely matter. Nothing spiritual I'd done before had ever been so delightful. And while I was watching a hot witch shake a maraca, was the demon twisting my innards? Was I wanting what other people had? No way. I was too busy being entranced, enjoying the strange beauty of the experience. After the spell, we went to a fire pit in the backyard to burn an image of a demon that I had brought with me. There was something tactile and satisfying about seeing the demon go up in flames, then turn to ash that the witch carefully foiled up in a tinfoil packet. Then, um, oh yeah. When I asked if I should leave the ash with her, the witch shuddered. I don't want that bad juju around here, she said. And then she gave me instructions on how to dispose of it far from her home. <laughs> When I arrived at my house late that night, my scientist husband emerged from our bedroom to hear how things had gone. What's that on your face, he asked, worried. 
but even as my hand rose to touch my cheek, I knew. That's ash from the demon I burned and then dumped at a crossroads where I will never go again, I said. Ah, he said, nodding. I think part of the reason he loves me is I don't bore him. I went into the bathroom and scrubbed the ash away with a wet washcloth. Was the demon gone forever after that night? At first, I was as envious as before, but when I felt the old twinge, I had a new tool. Go with honor, go with love, be gone, be gone, be gone, I banish you, I would say to the demon, just as the witch had taught me to do. This is a technique remarkably similar to cognitive behavioral tools focused on stopping negative ruminations. But a few months later, when I saw a kind friend's project featured in a popular magazine, I texted her with genuine enthusiasm and ran out and bought a hard copy for her. The act of kindness and support felt light, good. Soon after, that same friend told me she was suffering from depression. Raising small kids and trying to write was weighing on her. It was hard to find time to even shower, much less exercise. And she was envious of another author whose book was published on the same day as her own and was receiving more attention. It was after my first visit to the Oracle that I realized it. There are stories we tell ourselves about success, that it will heal us, that it will make us happy and whole and self-confident and well, that it will protect us from every disaster and heartbreak and illness and tragedy. And we know none of this is true. Logically, making a list of famous authors who have suffered terribly would disavow these lies. Virginia Woolf, Ernest Hemingway, Anne Sexton, Hunter S. Thompson, David Foster Wallace. Success does not heal. But certainly, for a very few of us, it does grant some sort of immortality. It guarantees we will be remembered. There are writers whose work we recognize in a line or two, and our hearts sing with recognition, even joy, and so they live on in us. Someone told me once that Jay Leno stopped worrying about his legacy after he mentioned Dick Van Dyke to an intern who thought he was making a gay joke. <laughs> <laughs> Going to see the witch has helped me to accept that no matter what I achieve in this lifetime, in many ways, I will forever be like the demon whose likeness I printed on paper and burned as will the people who materialize before me during my bouts of envy. We will die. We will be turned to ash, chips of bone. Someone who loved us will scatter us, maybe not at a crossroads, but certainly in the wind. And like the demon, we will be gone. Nothing left but a smudge of ash on a forehead. Nothing remaining that a washcloth cannot scrub away.